I'm dead. I'm sorry. If you would like to get your song reviewed, dear listener, there's the filthy capitalist option. It sorry says. 125 gets you straight to the head of the line. You don't have to be a part of alliance. You don't have to be part of the group. Wait a minute. And the biggest thing is you don't have to wait. You hop, skip, and jump right in front of everybody. 125 gets you there. You do that three times and then get matched down to the $75 rate for perpetuity. Yes! Also, there is a band review option. <laughs> so if you've got a band and you're trying to get your band some exposure, hit me up at sorry at gmail.com and I'll show you the details about how to pull you that off. You can also jump on Patreon and there is a option on the tiers to be able to get your band reviewed. Yep. Obviously, we can't lie to you. You, so we can't guarantee, can't guarantee a positive you review. A positive review. <laughs> get what you get. It's just rubbish. 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 That's British for garbage. Ah! My favorite is a community option. One door at the gate gets you in a Patreon. You get to join an alliance. The alliance joins their points together, and that helps determine what songs that we do. The alliances hang out on Discord. Message me on Patreon to get the link. And they do all kinds of other cool things. They do Minecraft. What? Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, yeah. It's really a community within the community. Anybody can go on the village, facebook.com backslash and sorry. There's 160 plus thousand people on the channel. What's cool about the Discord is that it offers a real opportunity for community connection, friendship, that type of thing. But, and it's on Discord, so if you're not a Facebook person, it's for you. You start off at a dollar. Right. Plus you get exclusives. Sorry and I are working on a song. So the first 15 seconds of that was on Patreon. Also, at $15 tier and above, when we actually debut the video, they're going to be there live with us. There you are, dear listener. Buy merch. Buy our merch indeed. A child shall lead them. To buy our merch. Yes, dear listener. Yes, dear listener. Yes, dear listener. DJ Ben is up tonight um, with a bunch of songs that just, like, literally came out within the last three months. So... Um, none of them have been heard by probably most of us. <laughs> All right, let's listen to some Metallica. Metallica! Okay, the title and opening track of Metallica's new album was my favorite, says DJ Ben. Uh, was my favorite one off the album, and here it is. Metallica, 72 Seasons, y'all. It's a title track. Uh, I guess it came out April 14th, so. Ian Aspie in the house. Ian, Ian Aspie in the house. <laughs> One of Soraya's favorite homo <laughs> sapiens for sure. All right, here we go. Metallica, 72 seasons. Let's do this shit. Oh, okay. Is this the official video? Metallica is pretty good about. I just downloaded whatever he said. Copyright stuff.
Japón. Metallica 72 Seasons. This is the album art. Is that a crib? Yeah. A black one. And it looks like this is a. Uh, so, this is what the album art looks like. Very interesting. Wow. That's a crib, right? It's got looks the like tricycle. tricycle a bike. It looks like everything's been burned. Yeah. Been I, think, I think it looks like, it looks like uh, that's a concept record. Maybe a bit. Uh, autobiographical almost mm -hmm. um but yeah that's a that's interesting 72 seasons is a very interesting i'm not sure what that actually means james hetfield is 59 years old <laughs> so it, it it can't be about him because he's well, only no, 72 he's, a, he's only 60 what do you got it depends on how many seasons they are i i thought it was like moons for some reason, I was thinking this meant 72 years, but 72 years for what? Have they been around? How long have they been around? No, it, it says um, 72 seasons, not yeah, years. But like if you had one harvest season, that's once a year. So 72 seasons. I thought it meant 72 years. Um, probably, but there's only four seasons according to Ben. <laughs> so maybe you divide four into 72. There are only four seasons. You no, there's only seasons. four seasons in a year. Right. But if, so if the you do season 72 is... seasons, you do 72... Divided by four? You divide it by four. <laughs> I don't think this is what it is. Divided by four. Is 18, it's 18 years. years. Yeah. No, I don't think it's 18 years. Yeah, I that makes sense. It's... The guy, the kid's 18 years old when he goes out to strike out on his own. Okay, well, actually, I don't really know that what makes the sense. song... Birth yeah, look, 18 years, see. birth to adulthood. Let's see, I actually didn't hear the lyrics, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, remember... The, the 72 Seasons is the name of the album as well as this particular record. Okay. Wait. The album plus this song. 18, this track. I, I, think, I think it's literally about this kid at 18 years old. Okay. And he's going out into the world. That's what I think. So okay. it would make sense that it starts off with this track. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, and, it, and the, the title thing shows, uh, you know, it shows a uh, crib. So I think yeah. I think this is this is this dude's 18th birthday, and it's talking about all the things that 
kind of made him who he is uh, up to this point. Okay. So, feeding on the wrath of man, shot down, traumatic, time haunted by the past, long gone, dogmatic, although the die is cast. Shot down, volcanic, but what is gone is gone and done. Look back, psychotic, no chance before this life began. So, at 18 years old, he, he's pretty much been shot down, never able to express himself. Um, he's got a dogmatic family, which obviously Hetfield was raised in the Christian science stuff, which ended up killing oh. his mother. Oh. His mother was sick. She wouldn't go to the hospital oh, and whatnot, and she ended up no. dying. So, you know, anytime somebody writes a concept record, you're automatically going to assume that it's autobiographical, even if the, even if the author's not trying to be yeah. directly, but it's almost like you can't escape who you are and you can't escape your own experiences or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So it looks to me like that's what's going on. Like he's, um, he, he's, he's 18 years old and he's looking back at all this stuff before he strikes out for himself, which I got my first guitar at 18. That's when I got my first, that, that picture yeah. where I was pulling, that was, that was my 18th birthday. Yeah. So, uh, time haunted by the past, long gone, dogmatic. That's usually if you're raised in a religious family, they're very dogmatic. Dogma yeah. is like the law, the, you know, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's, it's like holding on like almost like standard. a sectarian, like, this is what we believe. Everybody yeah. else is wrong about everything except for us type oh. of thing. Yeah. It's like being hyper dogmatic is like okay. that. Um, the die is cast. Like the, the, the roles he's supposed to function in have already been determined for him beforehand. Yeah, and he said down in the pre-chorus, staring into black light, dominating birthright. So right. like that, I think to me that was like right. also him, him dominating what he was, he has been given. And then if you look here, he says choking on the stage fright. Yeah. So again, like it's kind of autobiographical, mm -hmm. you know, where you've got this 18 year old kid who's, who's on his way and all these things kind of shaped who he is and what turned him into the person that he's turning into, which Hetfield is never really, I don't know, maybe this is the first sort of concept record that, that Metallica has done, but it, he has alluded to a lot of this stuff over time, like okay. issues with his dad, like the God that failed. Oh, right. You know, okay. his, you know, I think, you know, his experience with his mom, the unforgiven, I think had a lot to do with his upbringing and things of that nature. Um, but this is one, Hey, shout out to Paula. I haven't seen you in Hi. a while. Um, but th this seems to be one where like, it's like being addressed like directly where you're actually like incarnating as, as him throughout this record. Um, so it starts off with this anger. He's feeding on the wrath of men, which there are, there are a couple years in my life where you had to tap into that reserve, like that, that anger, that wrath, you kind of had to, I had, you kind of had to tap into that to survive. Then I look back, I'm like, did I really need to do that to survive? Not really. I really did you know, like I said, because th there were people that were able to navigate through that context and be completely fine. They didn't need to be that way. And the older you get, you kind of have to realize that a lot of the things that you say you were forced into were really decisions that you made. Mm. Like, it, it, it wasn't necessary for me to yeah. be like that. But in order for me to be the way I wanted to be, then I had to be that kind of person. Yeah. But here he says staring into black light. That's a that's a good line because it's it's like you're showing a path from the people in authority over you. This is the right way. This is the light. This is something good. Yeah. But the light is actually black light. It's actually not as good as the people that are oh. guiding you into it are telling you it hmm. is. Which is like staring into black light, dominating birthright. Yeah, I so, thought he was saying like you know when he's up on stage. And, like, there's all the lights that are out there. And so he's, like, staring out at that and he's dominating his birthright because maybe, like, you know, maybe the firstborn was given something in his family that the other ones weren't. Well, I mean, even biblically, it always seemed to go better for the firstborn. Maybe he's the firstborn. I don't know. That's what I well, thought he was talking about. Like, his doing the instruments. And when he talked about feeding on the wrath of man, 
that reminded me of, you know, you've told me like so many times you've said how there'll be bands that have like angry music or whatever. And then they have to stay like that because the people are not good with them leaving that. So he yeah. was like feeding off the wrath of man. Um, well, yeah, I, for me, that'd be a little bit premature because I don't think he becomes a rock star in this song until like the second verse. Mm-hmm. Cause then he talks about choking on stage fright. Right. Yeah. So um, he- to dominate it before you choke on it. It's kind of weird, yeah. Well, no, I, yeah, yeah I, I think I think the dominating birthright is not a good thing. It's a, this is what you're supposed, so for example, like if your dad was a, was a blacksmith yeah. and your last name was Smith, then your birthright would be to inherit the business. Mm-hmm. But what if you don't want to inherit the business? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. the, now the, the birthright dominates you. You're not, it's not a positive thing. Yeah. So staring into black, like dominating birthright to me is, is, is about like being told all your life, this is the right way. This is, this is the way to happiness. But then when you actually try to apply it, it doesn't make you happy. It makes the previous generation happy. The previous generation is, I mean, and, and you know, every parent yeah. goes through this, like, you know, you, you, you do X, Y, Z for your kids. You think it's the best for your kids, but in reality, like your kid has something else to do. And like you, you have to – when your kid is born, you have all these dreams for these kids, and they're they're your dreams. Like You just have to understand the difference between your dreams and your kid's dreams. Those are not the same thing all the time. Sometimes they are, and, you know, great. But other times, your dreams is your child's nightmare. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want to work in your blacksmith shop. He doesn't want to do – you know, he's got other passions. He's got other shit that's important to him. And that's one of the major issues, especially if you're religious where there's – theological import to to certain decisions that your child makes right like it can become very very stifling for somebody yeah uh wrath of man leeching through split in two that's a crazy line i think that one there is talking about the the split personality that kind of happens when you feed on that kind of energy for too long because then it goes right back into Wrath of Man. Yeah, because if you... If crash you, into point of what? Crash into... Crash into point of view. Hmm. Split into Wrath of Man, crash into point of view, violence, inheritance, thrive upon, feeding on. So, to me, it, it's just... Now he's, his personality is kind of split between this violent, angry person and then the role that he plays, generally speaking, in society and probably with his family. Crash into point of view. There it is again. And then, and, you know, it kind of like he gets split into two people because he's got to, do you share your parents' point of view or do you not? And that's one of the reasons why, like, it gets a little tiring sometimes, but there, there's a lot of, everybody in this family has a right to their own position mm-hmm. on any topic, literally right. any topic. Um, and they're, you know, obviously, you know, you have to defend it or whatever, whatever, but everybody's allowed to have, yeah. Their own perspectives on things. And there there's some things where it's like some of our kids are to the right of me on certain issues. Some of us, some of the kids are to the left of us on certain issues. It just depends. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're, you know, I think it's a lot easier for a parent now to have to allow their child to have variegated views because, you know, you have social media and things like that and where you're constantly, you can engage yourself in these in different perspectives but when headfield was growing up there were there was only one or two perspectives to choose from and and your parents were full of fear if you had because the parents didn't know the other perspectives either yeah that's a big thing that a lot of kids don't understand is like 90 percent of the mistakes your parents made were because they were terrified that something was going to come mess you up you see what i'm saying so like when you live in that sort of ignorant and I, I mean that in a technical sense, just lacking knowledge. You're, you're just ignorant to certain things. And then you're in this little community and the community is an echo chamber where everybody pretty much agrees. When your kid comes along and says, well, I don't really see it that way. It's like the end of the world, because not only are you worried about your kid's soul or whatever, you're also worried about what, what the little gonna what the little yeah. community is going to say. Yeah. And, you know, that that's a that's a crazy environment for any kid to have to deal with and you know he he turned it into something positive obviously he turned it into metallica but i think like if if you look at this song like it's it 
it says right there, mad seasons take their toll. New mass, chaotic, completely lost control. Shoot back, fanatic. Rider under, see, wither under looming shadow cast. Slip back, narcotic, blinded by the ashes of the past. So now he's got this going on. Mm-hmm. He's whatever. And now he's dealing with, you know, drugs and other things to yeah. deal with all the conflict that he has. Yep. Because it's taking, you know, you can, can you just imagine a, a an LGBT kid in a massively religious environment? You know, we talked about Scorched Earth a couple songs ago. Like, imagine, I can imagine, like, I remember the first time I was, like, watching a, following an LGBT YouTuber, and a couple of them seemed, like, so angry. I was like, this is odd. Like, <laughs> why is this dude so angry? And then I'm like, well... It, it, it's pretty pretty obvious why he would be so angry. You know, the guy was from like Nebraska or some shit. You know, some no disrespect to people in Nebraska, but not a not a not a place that's known necessarily for being the most pro LGBT. Mm-hmm. And so, imagine being a kid and your parents are completely against you. Your parents have been saying this shit, you know, your whole life. Then they find out that you're LGBT. They don't even stop to think. Maybe I was wrong here. Maybe I should rethink things. Whatever. Whatever. Yep. The next thing that the parent is worried about is how their reputation is going to be infected by the environment because now they've got this gay kid or whatnot. Like, you can see how a person would tap into anger and rage in order to maintain, like, their identity and, and, and however they feel at that particular moment. You could just imagine. Yeah. Um, you know, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. I remember the first time, like, we started the channel, people found out we were Christians. People say, what would happen if your kid yeah. came out as LGBT? That was a question. It was asked so much at the beginning. I was like, well, I would, oh, I'd tell them I love them or what? Like, I was so confused by the question. But, of course, then you start talking to people and you hear people's horror stories. And, of course, you know, we've got a bunch of kids. So, yeah, people people came to us and said, I'm X, Y, Z. And the first thing I said to them was, we love you unconditionally, blah, blah, blah. We didn't, we didn't have any conversations about changing anything. We didn't, we didn't even have a conversation about the Bible. I didn't bring the Bible in the conversation. I would just listen to, you know, um, and I know a lot of people can be like, oh, this is, this is bad Christian parenting. But, you know, I, I wanted to listen to what the person had to say. Like, they were not asking me yeah. for a prescription. They were not asking me for help. They were telling us. This is where I am. This is what I'm on. And so if you're not asking for help from a biblical, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Just considering all the tension there is between people, religion and, and, and the community. So I I didn't say anything other than we love you unconditionally and all the rest of it and explain more to me and, you know, explain how, how you came to realize this and all that. We just had a running conversation about it, you know, um, but I did, I did think that that was, I do, like, if I'm looking at this, there's a lot of ways we could handle that situation that would have created a situation like this. And, you know, I'm not even sure as parents that we're out of the woods yet with that particular yeah. individual, you know, like yeah, there's other, sure. there's <laughs> other things I, I think, think that my, they need to, they need to work out. I think that what I thought that I would be like when I would be presented with a situation was different than how I was. I think, like, I, I, you know, not sure that I was as, like, calm and listening as you. Like, I think that... Well, you were fearful. Yeah. I wasn't fearful at all. I was, yeah, I was fearful because I was afraid that, because social media, the honest to goodness, like, I think that my, the, the majority of my fear was coming from social media and realizing that when kids have access to those things, like they can be a part of a community. Like sometimes I'll see you watching different channels and I'm like, I wonder if that kid's parents even know that they're making those videos. Yeah. Because, and so like I, that, you know what I mean? Like that sort of, sort of starts freaking me out because, um, you know, it's not always the safest community to be a part of for kids. Which one? You know, when your kid is talking to you about how they're feeling and what they're going on, like it, my worry was, where are they? What are they involved in? Who are they talking to? Who are they? Who's influencing them? Like, you know, all these different questions. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I was definitely a lot more fearful than I thought I would be. I thought I was going to be like this cool, whatever. Like, yeah, I, I wasn't really worried about 
who was influencing them or because to me it, there's things that you can kind of see coming a mile away with certain with certain kids you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. so to me i was kind of i don't know if, if prepared for it was the right terminology but you know i i just it's I'm not going to freak. I, I'm just never going to freak out relative to the kids because I believe that God loves them more than I love them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's God's it's that's between them and God. Like my job is to be for there, be there for them, love them. I'm not, you know, I, I'm never told ever to worry about my kids in the Bible. As a matter of fact, we're always told not to be anxious, not to worry. So, you know, I. I, I kind of made that determination as far as like their spiritual. Obviously, if they got into a car accident or something and we're in a hospital, obviously, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you're going to be worried. But as far as like your kid, where they're going, the state of their soul, like I'm not worried about it. that's God's business. My business is just love them. They, he put those kids in front of us, so we're going to love them. And, and, you know, obviously it was, you know, a feedback I got from the, that kid was that you know it was very helpful and they felt confident coming out specifically to you know to me because they felt that they were you know it was, i don't want to be stereotypical but it was a safe it was a safe environment to come out of or whatever yeah um so you know like there's a lot of ways that this song this song can be you know, instruct. That's why it's good to have a partner. It, it's it's hard not to create your kid's life for them. It's very, very hard because, like I said, the moment you hold that child, you have all these dreams. You're thinking about them walking down the aisle. You're thinking about graduations. You're thinking, like, it's like, yo, it, it's almost certain that the future you have planned for your kid, he or she is going to want a different future. Mm-hmm. And it's not even you should handle that. It's you should be excited for that because that's actually one of the main ways that shows that you did a great job as a parent is if your kid is so secure in themselves and their abilities and so adventurous that they're willing to do something that they're completely unfamiliar with. Mm -hmm. Like if your kid wants to inherit the blacksmithing business, great. And that's, that's fine, but that's kind of a safe sort of selection. Your kid says, hey, we've been blacksmithing in this little town for 18 years, but I want to go off to here and do Mm -hmm. something Mm -hmm. like that tells me that that kid has been taught so well that they're they feel confident that they can take on anything. Mm -hmm. And instead of parents looking at that as like the ultimate compliment, they're looking at it like, oh, he doesn't want to do the blacksmith thing. So he's rejecting us as a as a as as an entirety. And, you know, a lot of people, your literal name was that Smith, you know, blacksmith, whatever. So, yeah, and I mean, I you think like in a small community, if you were the blacksmith, and then your son was like, "No, nah, Dad, I'm striking out on my own." People in the town are gonna be like, "Oh, he doesn't get along with his dad. He wants not like his dad." You know what I mean? Well, like, so then as the dad, you'd be like, "Yo, I don't want to." Yeah, it's like, <laughs> why, yeah, why don't you... yeah, exactly. It's but small honestly, town the more you care horrible. about what other people think, like I saw this post like I don't know, a week ago or something, and it basically said like people are gonna talk regardless. So just do what you want and just let them talk because they're gonna anyway. Yeah. Um, and I think that when people can adopt that, because I think that I think we add a lot of stress to our lives when we care so much about what other people think about what we're doing or what we look like or what we sound like. Um, it just, you know. Yeah, and you wouldn't want your children to become sex workers, right? No, no, I wouldn't want my kids to be sex workers. And if you look at the numbers, um, uh, According to the Farley report, about 90% of the people that engage in sex work would not have done so had they been in another financial situation. Right. And so, you know, my job there is to make sure particularly the girls are in a situation where they're never under financial duress. Mm -hmm. And like I told the boys, like, you know, we've got multiple businesses, blah, 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 blah. But the the main goal is to make sure the girls are straight for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that the boys are chopped liver. I'm just saying I'm never going to put my girls in a situation where they have to rely financially on a dude because I've seen what that does. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I put the boys on notice like you guys are on. <laughs> you guys are on. Your, no, obviously, we got a family business, whatever. But one of the main reasons I'm doing everything that I do is particularly for those girls. So, 
Um, if you know, and and look, you do not see um, financially independent women, 18, 19 year old financially independent women going into this industry. You know, these girls are going to OnlyFans and all this other shit because they're they're in a bad economic situation and they think that if they, you know, do whatever in front of a camera that they can live. Of course, that's actually not the case with OnlyFans. OnlyFans functions just like YouTube. There's only 1% of people who are making serious money on that platform. So, And then once um, your stuff's out there, it's out there. Yeah, yeah. And once the shit is out there, it's out there. Correct. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I talk to us, guys. It looks like. Hmm. Let me try to change some of the uh... settings. Yeah. Let me see if I can if I switch it. From... Yeah, it's come. We're gonna we're we're trying to work on it. Yeah. Um... It looks. It looks like it. <laughs> They're back. They're talking about OnlyFans. Well, that's that's a good sign. Um, yeah. So, so I, I do I do think the song is kind of a precautionary tale of the parents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, in the sense of you just have to be careful, and and it's it's a tough balance. And like I I don't think that the the OnlyFans question or the sex worker question was out of bounds. I don't think that th- that's out of bounds. I would never, you know, if my daughter t- told me that, I would I would give her the same answer as any other answer, which is, you know, we love you unconditionally. But I would do anything and everything to get them the hell out of that industry for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I do think there's a big difference between saying that you're LGBT versus saying that you're a sex worker. I think there's a there's a world of a difference there. I think I think people are born. uh with with certain inclinations i don't think anybody is born uh, uh a sex worker yeah yeah i i agree with you i think that that's more just video bad oh yeah, it's so good yeah. um and i think the video will stay bad if you stay on my iphone i don't know i don't know it's saying right now it's saying excellent oh okay i'd lay down the law and say no well you can say that yeah. <laughs> Wait, do you have any kids? You, you, you could say, say no. that, but what, what, I mean. I look, mean, I did the same your thing. Your kid's like, not going to do OnlyFans unless they're 18 years old anyway, right? So it's it's like, if you say no, what will happen? Like, it's, it's, it's not like your kid, it's not like the girl, and, you know, Ian, you don't have any kids yet, so, you know, you, but it's not like they're going to come to you and ask so you permission. To see how far you to prove a child's aspirations. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's. It's it's not like you're gonna go and uh, and say no to your kid, and your kid's like, you know what? I was gonna think about doing something like OnlyFans, but now that my dad said no, I'm not gonna do it. Like, that's I, not how kids operate, yeah. especially if they're gonna do something as drastic as that. They've already thought through the ramifications and all that. Your no is not going to affect them. <laughs> Your no is the, the deciding factor of whether they're going to tell you what's up or not. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Uh, once, you beca- once you become a parent, you, you have to be a lot more diplomatic than when you're not a parent. <laughs> so I'm still learning the art. Like, like, obviously, I wouldn't want any of the kids in, in sex work, but if they came up to me and told me they were going into sex work, I would not say... No, absolutely not, because that's just not effective. Of course, I don't want them in that situation, but saying no and laying down the law <laughs> I won't is say not effective. Is, but I literally only heard you say no once. This is not going to happen. With that person, <laughs> with a specific situation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there was, but that was something where they would need our permission to do mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But if it's within our purview, sure. But if your kid is 18 plus and they want to get into sex work, you saying no is not going to to solve the problem. I mean, good luck. I've been at my local LGBT group and God's how many of them have had to do OnlyFans or other sex work to survive. I knew it was bad. Yeah. No, exactly. Only to survive. Correct. You know, that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm, right. I'm putting, I'm working and putting the girls in the situation 
where that's not the case. Yeah. See exactly. what I'm saying? But if it if it was the case where they really felt like they were under financial duress and somehow and the other thing is like no girl is gonna come to her father and, and announce to her dad that she's doing sex work. Like that's generally not how it goes. What ends up happening is you somebody went to else. Walmart and somebody says, you know, your daughter. You know what I'm saying? So uh so Ian says he's got solutions. Ian, I would I would advise you to be extremely careful about your <laughs> solutions because a lot of the shit that you you think you know goes out the window when you're actually responsible for that human being. <laughs> yep, I thought I knew so much. <laughs> I re- we, used to t- <laughs> we have a seventeen year old. I'm still struggling, <laughs> yeah. but I thought I knew. Yeah, 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 yeah. Vin will smile and say, okay, and lock them in the basement. <laughs> you see, my goal is to be the type of parent that if the kids were thinking about actually doing that, that they would come to me and bounce ideas off of me. Like, that's kind of my goal. And I do have that kind of relationship with, with, with one of them. Um, but, uh, yeah, all I'm saying is be very careful about what your solutions are because – you have to know that child and that specific child. And there's a whole history and there's a lot of things that go into, you know, we talk about this all the time. Cause so it's like, how do you do that? And blah, blah, blah. But a lot of it is like, I don't plan anything. Like a lot of it is just like an empty slate and you have to take each situation like individually. Is, I feel like that you're, you're talking from a bit of privilege, babe. You've been a lot of places and you've learned a lot of things. Sure. And you can talk to a lot of people. Sure. I went into it with a blank slate myself and it didn't sure. go well. <laughs> sure. The first time, you know, sure. I was like, you know, did the, I love you. You know, I already knew, blah, blah, blah. But then, you know, after the third conversation with it, I didn't do so smoothly. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I just think like yeah. you're talking from privilege because I don't feel like a lot of people. I do think Ian, Ian I, d- I do think that you're, you know, you're ignorant, obviously ignorant in the technical sense. You're lacking knowledge because you don't have kids. And th- the facts are the more kids that you have, the more you realize how much you don't know. Because if you have one kid, you're like, oh, I got this. I got this figured out. I'm a boss, blah, blah, blah. You get two kids. You're like, this is a little bit more complex. You get three kids. You're like, what the freak's going on here? Four, five, six, seven. Like there's a lot. And you don't know everything about everybody. And and you can't. There's not enough time in the day to know everything about everybody. So um, it, it, it's just so many. That's why leaning on like knowing. Like I do think about that. I think about the panic that I saw in my father's eyes when he would look at me. And, um, he was afraid of so many things. And I don't think that he had to be afraid of all the things that he was, but he, he still was. And, um, I, I know that when I got alone, it wasn't that my father said, no, you can't do this. Cause he did say no about a lot of things. It was the, it was, I felt God saying, don't do this, go that direction or do this or whatever. Like, and, and I kind of felt like that. I kind of had that, like God, what God, you, what you said earlier, like God has our kids, like he's the one that's in charge of this. So, I mean, I don't know what to tell you if you don't believe that God exists and you've never seen his, his influence in your life. Like, I don't know, that would be a little bit more scary. I think. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I just think that if you keep an open, you know, dialogue with your kids and that you're honest with them and that you accept them. Not they accept them, but that you love them and you celebrate everything there is to celebrate them. I just, I think that's about 90% of it. I think if you just try not to impose your template, which is very difficult to do because it's not like you can let the kid create his own moral compass. If that was the case, They'd be coming home with G.I. Joe's every day. You see what yeah, I'm saying? I was just listening so to you saying something to me. It's a real, it's a real balance. Go ahead. We're Today you were listening to something and the mother was like, you know, I just decided when my child was born that I was not going to teach her anything and just let her figure it out herself. I'm like, why do people yeah, that think ridiculous. that sounds so amazing? That literally sounds like the worst trash parenting I've ever heard of. Yeah, what do you mean? It's, it's You're going to let them figure it out on their own. That's pretty I terrible. am so grateful that my father gave me his love for Jesus. Like, I'm... Like when I'm in my craziest, like I'm having the hardest time, like I hold on to the words of my father. Yeah. What I'm talking about is like the template of like, this is your life. This is what you're going to be. You're going to mm-hmm. be married and you're going to have four kids. And you're going to have a picket fence. And you're going to like, 
Some you're of gonna, our kids, a lot of parents say you're going to college. Some of our kids, that's not the life that they, that's not the life they're going to mm-hmm. have. They're just not going to have that life. Yeah. Some of them are going to have multiple marriages and baby daddy. Like that, that's just how. Like you have to understand that about your kids. And like, or like in the song, he was talking about like the 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 birthright, the tyranny of the birthright, where the kid now has to live in this in this pre planned mm. sort of path. That's that's that's, and I I think that like. It's hard because you have to keep your own principles, like on the one hand, and you want to inculcate those to your children, no matter what you are. If you're a secular humanist, mm-hmm. you most likely want your kid to be a secular humanist. You don't want your kid to be a, a nihilist, for example, mm-hmm. or you don't want your kid to be a hedonist. Most secularists don't want their kid to be a, just a selfish, mm-hmm. you know, me, me, me. You want the kid to be sort of altruistic. So my point is, there are aspects of your mentality and philosophy that you want your child to adopt and then there are other aspects where the kid needs to come up with it on his own and then finding the balance between those is what makes you a good or a bad parent so 9.6 i really love this song Uh, 9.6 for me as well really Yeah. yeah okay well there you go I gotta get a turn. Uh, shout out to uh, Sori's uh, hotspot because it looks like it's working for us. It's, I gotta uh, get a charger. Yeah, it's got the excellent thing on there, so it looks like we're looks like we're decent for now. We've got a commercial break, dear listener. There's more metal on the way. We shall return. 